Does your gut say that there is a theory of everything? So this is po even possible to unify, to find this language that unifies general relativity and quantum mechanics? I believe so. I mean, the history of physics has been that of unification, much like mathematics um, over the years. You know, electricity and magnetism were, were separate theories, and then Maxwell unified them. You know, Newton unified the, the motions of the heavens with the motions of, on, of objects on the Earth and so forth. So it should happen. Uh, it's just that the... Um, uh, again, to go back to this model of, of the observations and, and, and theory, part of our problem is that physics is a victim of its own success. That our two big theories of, of, of physics, general relativity and quantum mechanics, are so are so good now is that together they cover ninety nine point nine percent of sort of all the observations we can make. Um, and you have to like either go to extremely insane particle accelerations or or the early universe or, or, or things that are really hard to measure um, in order to get any deviation from either of these two theories to the point where you can actually figure out how to, how to combine them together. Um, but I have faith that we, you know, we, we've, we've been doing this for centuries, and we've made progress before, and there's no reason why we should stop. Do you think it will be a mathematician that develops a theory of everything? What often happens is that when the physicists need uh, um, some theory of math mathematics, there's often some precursor that the mathematicians um, worked out earlier. So when Einstein started realizing that space was curved, he went to some mathematician and asked, you know, is there is there some theory of curved space that the mathematicians already came up with that could be useful? And he said, oh yeah, there's a, I think a, Riemann came up with something. Um, and so yeah, Riemann had developed you know, Riemannian geometry, um, which is precisely um, you know, a, a, a theory of spaces that are curved in, in various general ways, which turned out to be almost exactly what was needed um, for Einstein's theory. This is going back to, to witness unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. I think the theories that work well to explain the universe tend to also involve the same mathematical objects that work well to solve mathematical problems. Mm. Ultimately, they're just sort of both ways of organizing data um, in, 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 in useful ways. It just feels like you might need to go some weird land that's very hard to to intuit. Like yeah, you, know, yeah, you have like string theory. Yeah, that that's, that was that was a leading candidate for many decades. It's, I think it's slowly pulling out of fashion because it's it's not matching experiment. Uh, so one of the big challenges, of course, like you said, is experiment is very tough. Yes. Because of the, how effective yeah. both theories are. But the other is like, just, you know, you're talking about, you're not just deviating from space time. You're going into like some crazy number of dimensions. Yeah, you're doing yeah. all kinds of weird stuff that to us, we've gone so far from this flat earth that we started yes. at, like you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Now we're just, it's its very hard to use our limited ape descendants of a, a cognition to intuit what that reality really is like. This is why analogies are so important. You know, I mean, so yeah, I mean, the round earth is not intuitive because we're, we're stuck on it. Um, but, you know, but you, 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 you know, but round objects in general, we have pretty good intuition mm -hmm. over. Uh, and we have intuition about light works and so forth. And like, it's, it's actually a good exercise to actually work out how eclipses and phases of, of the sun and the moon and so forth can be really easily explained by, 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 by round earth and round moon, you know, um, and models. Um, and, and you can just take, you know, a basketball and a golf ball and, and, a, and, a, and a light source and actually do these things yourself. Um, so the intuition is there. Um, but yeah, you have to transfer it. That is a big leap intellectually for us to go from flat to round earth mm -hmm. because, you know, our life is mostly lived in flat land. Yeah. To load that information and we're all like, take it for granted. We take so many things for granted because science has established a lot of evidence mm -hmm. for this kind of thing. But, you know, we're on a r r round rock. Yeah. <laughs> flying through space. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a big leap. And you have to take a chain of those leaps the more and more and more we progress. Right, yeah. So modern science is maybe, again, a victim of its own success, is that, you know, in order to be more accurate, it has to, to move further and further away from your initial intuition. And so, um, for someone who hasn't gone through the whole process of science ed education, it looks more and more suspicious yeah. because of that. So, you know, we, we, we need we need more grounding. I mean, I, I think... Um, I mean, you know, there are there are scientists who do excellent outreach, um, but there's there's, there's 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 lots of science things that you can do at home. I, there's lots of YouTube videos. I did a YouTube video recently of Grant Sanderson. That we talked about this earlier that uh, you know how the ancient Greeks were able to measure things like the distance of the moon, distance of the Earth, and you know using techniques that you you could also replicate yourself. Um, it doesn't all have to be like fancy space telescopes and and very really intimidating mathematics. Yeah, that's uh, I highly recommend that. I believe you give a lecture and you also 
did an incredible video with Grant. It's a beautiful experience to try to put yourself in the mind of a person from that time, mm -hmm. shrouded in mystery. Right. You know, you're like on this planet, you don't know the shape of it, the mm -hmm. size of it. You see some stars, you see some, you see some things, and you try to like localize yourself in this world. Yeah, yeah. And try to make some kind of general statements about distance to places. Change of perspective is really important. You say travel broadens the mind. Uh, this is intellectual travel. You know, put yourself in the mind of the, of the ancient Greeks or or some other person, some other time period. Make hypotheses, spherical cows, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, speculate. Um, and you know, this is this is what mathematicians do, and some other you know, sort of artists do actually. It's just incredible that, given the extreme constraints, you could still say very powerful things. That's why it's inspiring. Looking back in history, how much can be figured out right. when you don't have much right. to figure well, out stuff. If with. you propose axioms, then the mathematics lets you, you know, follow those axioms to to their conclusions, and sometimes you can get quite a lo quite a long way from you know, initial hypotheses. If we can stay in the land of the weird, you mentioned general relativity. You've uh, <laughs> you've contributed uh, to the mathematical understanding of Einstein's field equations. Can you explain this work? And uh, from a sort of mathematical standpoint, uh, w what aspects of general relativity are intriguing to you, challenging to you? I have worked on some equations. There's something called the, the wave maps equation or the sigma field model which is not quite the equation of space-time gravity itself, but of certain fields that might exist on top of space-time. Um, so Einstein's equation of relativity just describes space and time itself. Um, but then there's other fields that live on top of that. Uh, there's the elect electromagnetic field, um, there's uh, things called Yang-Mills fields, and there's this whole hierarchy of different equations, of which Einstein is considered one of the most nonlinear and difficult. But relatively low on the hierarchy was this thing called the wave maps equation. So it's a wave which, at any given point, uh, is fixed to be like on a sphere. Um, so uh, I can think of a bunch of arrows in space and time, and, 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 and the arrows are pointing in, in different directions. Um, but they propagate like waves. If, if, if you wiggle an arrow, it, was, it will propagate and, create, and make all the arrows move kind of like uh, sheaves of wheat in the wheat field. And I was interested in the global regularity problem again for this question. Like, is it possible for, for all the energy here to, to, to collect at a point? So the equation I considered was actually what's called a critical equation, where it's actually the behavior at all scales is roughly the same. Um, and I was able barely to show that um, that you couldn't actually force a scenario where all the energy concentrated at one point, that uh, the energy had to disperse a little bit, and the moment it disperses a little, little bit, it, 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 would, it would stay regular. Yeah, this was back in 2000. That was part of why I got interested in Navier Stokes afterwards, actually. Yeah, so I developed some techniques to, um, to solve that problem. So Part of it is it, it was um, this problem is really nonlinear uh, because of the curvature of the sphere. Um, there's, there was a certain nonlinear effect which was a non-perturbative effect. It was when you sort of looked at it normally, it, it looked larger than the linear effects of the wave equation, um, and so it was hard to to keep things under control, even when your energy was small. But I developed what's called a gauge transformation. So the equation is kind of like an evolution of, of, of sheaves of wheat, and, and they're all bending back and forth, and so there's a lot of motion. Um, but like, if you imagine like stabilizing the flow by attaching little cameras at different points in space, which are trying to move in a way that captures most of the motion, and under this sort of stabilized flow, the flow becomes a lot more linear. I discovered a way to transform the the equation to reduce the amount of, of nonlinear effects, um, and then I was able to 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 solve the equation. I found this transformation while visiting my aunt in Australia, and I was trying to understand the dynamics of all these fields, and I, I couldn't do it with pen and paper. Um, and I had not enough facility of computers to do any computer simulations. So I ended up closing my eyes, being on, on, on the floor, and just imagining myself to actually be this vector field and rolling around to try to, to see how to change coordinates in such a way that somehow things in all directions would behave in a reasonably linear fashion. And uh, yeah, my aunt walked in on, on me while I was doing that, and she was asking, "What are that? What am I doing doing this?" It's uh, complicated. Is the yeah, answer. yeah, and you know, she said, <laughs> okay, fine. You know, you're a young man. I don't ask questions. <laughs>